Before we pop over into JUMP, I just have one slide to share with you here to give you a high level um, view of what I hope to share with you today. So uh, we'll start out uh, using a JUMP project file to organize a Six Sigma project using the DMAIC methodology. We'll talk more about that. I hope to show you how you can link external files in JUMP projects for easy access. You can manage all of your Six Sigma files within a JUMP project, not just the data and the results. Um, I'm going to show you how to include images, notes, so that you can remember uh, your reasoning for why something was done so that you're always prepared for a toll gate review uh, at a moment's notice. Uh, we're going to take a look at how to set up and analyze a classic two-level factorial design and fit a model to the data. Um, we're going to see how to use Monte Carlo simulation within JUMP to estimate the long-term process results while considering the variation in the controllable factors. Again, we can do that within JUMP. Um, we're going to estimate the improved process capability with a great new JUMP add-in, and we're going to do that based on simulated results. And lastly, we're going to visualize the improvement we've made to our process on a control chart, again, based on simulated data. Now, I'm going to show you all of this uh, within the context of a real Six Sigma project that I completed at Arizona State University. And I was looking to reduce the moisture loss of my baked cakes. I'm a baker, and it bothered me a lot when I'd end up with a dried uh, product in the end. So I hoped to address that with this project. So let's pop over to jump. And here is my jump project file. So if you're new to projects, this is not what jump looks like when you first open it, but you can get a similar view where all of our windows are going to be contained uh, within this project. So to open a new project, we can jump up here to the file menu, go to new, and you can select project. And once you do that, you're going to get a view similar to what I'm sharing here with the exception of you will not by default see this bookmarks section here. But what you will have that you didn't have before is this project menu at the top. You're only going to see the project menu when you're in a project. And from here, you can choose to show bookmarks. And that's going to add this section into your jump project. Now, this can be really handy if you're trying to uh, keep the size of your project file down. If you don't want to embed all the files in your project, maybe there's some external files that you're sharing with other team members and they need to access those files outside of the project. This is a great way to do that. Okay, And that is separate from the stuff down here in the contents section. The, the items that we'll talk about here in the contents section are embedded within this project file. And I know that initially, when I started working with Jump Projects, um, Scott had a really great tip for me on saving things within bookmarks versus contents. I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about that, Scott. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I think when, when you get started with projects, there's a couple things to keep in mind when you work with them. First is, it's like Marilyn saying, everything in a bookmark exists outside the project. And then everything that's in that content section actually exists within the project. So if you wanted to have all these files and share them with someone else, you can drop them in the contents and then share that single project file and they'll get everything in the contents. Um, I think that the time to use bookmarks um, is if you have very large files and then you don't put them in the project so that they stay external to the project. Um, so it's just some, you know, and, and as you develop your projects, you'll figure out if you want to keep it as a bookmark or in the contents, but just keep in mind that those two files are different. So if you change something in your bookmark file, it's not going to change it in the content file and vice versa. Great. Thanks for the tip. I know that really helped me when I got started with um, jump projects. So if you're new to DMAIC or the DMAIC methodology uh, for Six Sigma, I'll tell you briefly about that. It's one of many methodology methodologies for process improvement. And DMAIC stands for these five phases you see here in my contents tab, define, measure, analyze, improve, and control. And whether you're adding files or folders in the bookmark section, you can use the red triangles here within JUMP. 
In my case, I added folders first, and then I added files um, within these folders. So I'm going to expand each of my folders as we move along here, starting with the define phase. So let's take a look um, here. You'll notice I've got the project charter up here in bookmarks, and if I hover over that, you can see I've got that file saved in a specific directory. Now this is a different version of the same file that is embedded within my project. So I've got the same file in two different places. So let's take a look at the uh, define phase. And here I've linked a Word document, that's an external file that has our project charter, all right? So this is just a brief description defining what my project is um, and detailing what I'm hoping to achieve with this project. And as I mentioned in the beginning, my objective here was to minimize the moisture of baked chocolate cakes. So that's what we're gonna be taking a look at here. And I'll just close this window out. It's an external file so that um, opens separately. Let's take a look at our measure phase. Um, here we're using some measurements uh, and kind of defining the problem a little more narrowly. And to do that, what I did here is I used some historical data to kind of establish a baseline. So this was also real data that I collected quite a few years ago, as you can see by the dates. And I have a save script here for a distribution that I'm gonna go ahead and run. So typically, if we're starting a Six Sigma project or uh, other improvement project, we're gonna wanna establish kind of our baseline. And you might do that if you had more data by taking a look at a histogram. Well, in my case, I just have nine data points here. So, you know, that's not gonna look great on a histogram. So instead, I'm visualizing my historical measurements on a normal uh, quantile plot to assess the distribution. So the points are pretty close to the diagonal line. Um, here I've noted that the Anderson-Darling normality test has a high p-value. That is down here in my jump output. So this data follows uh, a normal distribution. Notice I've added here some notes, right? These are annotations, which are pretty nice if you're trying to document what you did, your reasoning for doing things. If you're looking at this later, or if you need to uh, present at a toll gate review, you don't have to go back and figure out why you did what you did again. You have it here documented in a nice little note. Yeah, Marilyn, maybe just really quick. Can yeah. You, the annotation's really cool. It's something that I wish I had done more, um, but it's super easy. Do you mind just showing folks how they can create those annotations? Absolutely, good point. So um, we have this tools menu. And the tools menu is available anywhere in Jump. But if you click on tools, you'll notice here's an annotate button. So if you choose that, click that button, and then click wherever you wanna add your note. And it's that easy to document um, within a project or any Jump file, really. All right, so uh, moving along here, the other thing that I did as part of establishing my baseline is I took a look at my historical data and I needed to set a specification, right? An objective uh, for the moisture loss. And so what I did, since I only have a one-sided spec, is I just using the formula that I'm showing you here, I calculated CPU. So CPU um, is it's similar to CPK, right? CPK is a common metric to evaluate how good your process is. And um, CPK is really the lesser of CPU and CPL. You're just comparing your spec limit and the edges of your distribution and, and the worst side is your CPK. So my CPU here, I only have a one-sided specification. I don't wanna lose too much moisture, but I don't have um, a lower specification because the only way to achieve no moisture loss is to not bake the cake, right? And I don't wanna eat cake batter. The purpose is to minimize the moisture loss of the baked cakes. So CPU, uh, this is where we're at, uh, and it's a negative value. So we know that this is really quite a terrible process that we need to improve, but it makes sense that CPU or CPK is negative because again, I set my baseline 
at the lowest previously achieved moisture loss value. So the mean and all of these other values are above my upper spec limit. So let's take a look at what we might do to improve this. Continuing here in the measure phase, um, the next thing I did was brainstorm a little bit uh, about what could be causing issues with the moisture loss. And I visualized that on a cause and effect diagram or Ishikawa diagram. So here we're looking at what's affecting the moisture content after baking. And you can see that these root causes are grouped by several categories. We have some held constant factors. So the baking pan, the oven, and the scale I used for taking my measurements, which I'll talk more about in a moment, uh, we're gonna hold constant. We have some things we can't control, like the ambient moisture and ambient temperature. And then we've also got some controllable design factors. So those are gonna be the baking time, the baking temperature, and the cake mix brand. I love to bake, uh, but when it comes to cakes, uh, I like to hit the easy button and use a cake mix. I'll tell you more about that in a moment. The last grouping here are our nuisance or blocking variables. And in my case, that's gonna be the day of the week. And I'll tell you more about that in a moment. Now, details of all of this are included down here. Again, I used uh, the annotations that we already talked about to document what I did and why. So you can see what I uh, decided to experiment with to see if we can make an improvement. So we have the cake mix brand. Now, those these are two real national cake brands, but I've masked the names to protect the innocent um, for this purposes of this presentation. We've got the ranges for our oven temperature. That's two levels. The low is 350 and the high is going to be 380. And the baking time in minutes, uh, the low is 38 and the high is 46. And justification for these levels is documented down here. I won't read all of that to you. Uh, but what we have here is a two to the three, right? Two levels per factor and three factors in total. And so for a two to the three, if we do a full factorial, that's going to be eight runs. So that means I need to bake eight cakes, which even for someone that likes baking, that's just too much for just one day. And that is why I'm going to use a block to account for the day of the week. I'm hoping to break up those cakes and, and bake those eight cakes over two different days. So let's take a look at how I'm measuring the moisture loss. That I have documented in this JPEG that I've added. Again, using this red triangle, we can add pretty much any file type we want in here. So I hope this gives you an idea of uh, the process for making the cakes and for measuring the moisture loss. So first we mix all the ingredients into a bowl, we pour the batter into the pan, and we weigh the batter um, in the pan to obtain the initial sample weight. The cake is baked, and then later, while the cake is still in the pan, we weigh it um, to obtain the final sample weight. And now the initial and final sample weight are plugged into this formula right here to calculate the percentage of moisture that was lost. So Marilyn, can I yeah. interrupt you just a second there? This is Jerry. Yeah, hey yeah, Jerry. I, I see your scale there and having done Six Sigma things in the past, I wondered if you did, happened to do a measurement system analysis on your scale. Now you always have, you always bring up a good a point, Jerry. You'll see down here in my documentation that I just really wasn't sure about how good that scale was. It didn't always seem to give me the same measurement every time. And so instead of doing the right thing, and doing an MSA, I, I hit the easy button again, and I just took the measurements a couple of times and averaged out. It probably would have been better to do an MSA, wouldn't you agree? Uh, well, of course, that's what we would recommend, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> right, but we can do that and jump, right? We've got an that's option right. for setting up an MSA. Yeah, under the DOE, and uh, you're going right to it, special purpose, and then MSA design, we've got all those tools built in for you. MSA is really just another experiment that you can do 
but it's kind of a special experiment where you typically have operators and parts and maybe instruments and then a measurement that you're going to do. Um, Jump has the ability to create that design for you. And then we even have the ability, uh, depending on whether your test is what we call crossed, where every, every operator sees every part, or if it's nested, where some operators, because say some of the operators are in one plant and other operators are in another plant, uh, they can't see all of the same parts. Some have to measure different parts than others do. That might be called a, a nested design. And we've got the capability to do that uh, also here within the, within the DOE um, tools. Great, thanks for the tip. Definitely, if I did this again, I think I might go ahead and run an MSA or linearity oh. and bias study or something instead of doing the average, but great. Well, let's move along then onto the analyze phase. And so here, I already told you a little bit about the factors that we are going to experiment with, um, and here they are. So there's three factors, and each of the factors has two levels, cake uh, mix brand A and B, the oven temperature at two levels, and the baking time at two levels. And so I'm going to show you uh, the classic two-level factorial design that I set up and how you could do this in Jump as well. So I'm going to go to DOE. I'm going to go to classical, two-level screening, screening design. And so here uh, at the top under Y response, we're going to put in moisture loss. And my objective is to minimize the moisture loss. So I can set my objective here and Jump is going to remember that um, throughout. And then I could add my uh, factors down here at the bottom, but instead of uh, making you watch me type, I'm just going to ask Jump to load my factors in from that factor table that I showed you. And so here we have our two to the three. The cake mix brand is categorical at two levels and then oven temperature and baking time at two levels each as well. I'm going to continue, and here I'm going to tell Jump that I would like to choose from a list of factorial designs. All right, so again, a two to the three, if we do a full factorial, that's going to be eight runs. So here, number of runs is going to be eight. We could do a fractional factorial with just four runs, but that's only going to let us estimate the main effects. And I thought, you know, there might be some interactions here, so that's why I want to do the full factorial. And as I'd mentioned before, we're going to include a block because I only want to bake four cakes a day instead of eight. So we're going to go with um, this option here. I'm going to click continue. We're going to randomize uh, the order of uh, our runs by default. And the other thing that I did was I, I wasn't sure if there was going to be some curvature in my response surface. So I went ahead and included some center points. I'm going to add four center points and I'm going to hit make table. And so that's how I set up that design, uh, classic design here in Jump. So Marilyn, if I could interrupt again. I'm, so you, you chose from the very start to uh, go with a full factorial test. I know that Jump's got these other tools like the custom designer uh, that allows you to make more efficient tests get the same kind of information with fewer runs. Why did you choose to do it this way? And what else can we expect out of the, the custom DOE platform? Definitely when you know better, you do better, right? And had yeah. I known about custom designs, I probably would have gone that route because I know now that the custom design lets me tell Jump what I'm trying to study, what terms I want to estimate. I can add some restrictions in there. And Jump is going to use a modern algorithm to find the best design to help me answer my question as an investigator. But I didn't know about custom design at the time. I knew about factorial designs, and so you do what you can with what you know, right? All right, so this is my design. Uh, this pattern uh, column is interesting in Jump, I think. The minus means the first factor is at the low level, and then these zeros are center points. This second row, minus, 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 all factors at the low level. So we're going to collect our data for each run. Each row in here, there's 12 in total because I added center point runs. 
we're working across two days, so I'm going to bake six cakes per day and then calculate that moisture loss and enter that here. Thankfully for you, you don't have to watch me do all of that. I'm just going to um, hit the easy button again and show you the results. So I really did bake 12 cakes. Um, everyone in the office got multiple cakes uh, as gifts. So yeah, a lot of baking um, over two days. Here are the results. And you'll notice I modified this table here. I added a center point column. And this just says, you know, these eight runs are the corner points in my design. And then I've got some center points. And really, this is because I wanted to see a test for curvature in my output when I fit this model. And for any of you that are interested in the details of how to do this, I actually found a great article in the JUMP community where you can learn a lot more about using JUMP and get lots of tips. One of my colleagues wrote a blog post about how to incorporate a test for curvature in your output. So let me tell you a little more about that. I'm going to hit model using the script that um, jump put in the table automatically for me. And because I already told jump what design I wanted, jump knows what terms we're going to estimate the main effects, the two way interactions and the block. And the only other thing I'm going to add is this center point column by clicking add. So that'll be included in my analysis. I'm going to hit run. And here I have um, an actual versus predicted uh, plot. We want the points to be close to the diagonal line for a good fit. That looks pretty good. We've got a really high R squared. And if I scroll down a little bit into my effect summary here, Jump is showing me from most important to least important, which terms are important in predicting the moisture loss. So we can use these p-values right, terms with a high p-value, not important, so we can kick them right out of the model. And I love this because I can select a term that is not significant and I can just remove it interactively from this report. I don't have to go back to another window and rerun the model or anything like that. And here we can see that center point test is not significant. We have a high p-value, so we can just remove it. And we can continue uh, reducing the model term by term. I'm just going to show you the final model here where I have already optimized my results. These are my optimal design settings. Here's the effect summary at the top so you can see we only have significant terms. And down here we have our profiler. And so I asked Jump to go ahead and maximize desirability and find me the best settings. And I have those saved down here. Now this profiler shows us the predicted moisture loss of these baked cakes using the settings we see here below in red. So we see the shape and direction of the impact each factor has on the response. I can click and drag the line and it makes sense if we increase the temperature, the moisture loss increases as we increase the baking time, same thing happens. And I can always click optimal again to return to the best settings here. Now, notice I have another annotation here. This is a good uh, thing to note. The optimal settings say let's use brand A because there's less moisture loss. And we can see that in this graph. However, if we use brand B, we are still below our upper spec limit, which you can see represented by this blue line. So the next thing I want to show you is that you can run some Monte Carlo simulations and jump right from this platform. To do that, we're going to go to the red triangle and turn on the simulator. So what am I doing here? We're going to take a look at what this process is going to look like in the long term given that, you know, I can't really control my oven temperature very well. I might set it at 350, but it's going to vary up and down a little bit. And probably I'm going to use cake mix A most of the time, but I might use B. So let's incorporate that information and see what the impact on the moisture loss is going to be. So first oven temperature, we're going to tell jump that this is random. And it follows a normal distribution, but it could follow a different distribution. 
and we can introduce the parameters for that distribution. I'm going to set the oven at 350, but I know that there's some variation. The standard deviation is about four degrees. And then, you know, we're going to use cake mix A probably most of the time uh, because it loses less moisture. But if B is on sale, we're going to use cake mix B. 75% of the time we'll use A, and part of the time we're going to go ahead and use B. Give this an OK. And now we're going to go ahead and simulate this. 10,000 times, Jump is going to choose one of these two cake mix brands, most of the time A, but some of the time B. 10,000 times, Jump is going to choose a random value from this distribution. And we're going to keep the baking time fixed because we can just set a timer, and that's good. And so 10,000 times, we're going to get these values, put them through our regression equation, our model that we fit to the data, and we're going to predict the moisture loss. So here we go. I'm going to hit simulate. And just that quickly, we see a little histogram here that represents our simulated moisture loss values. Again, we can see our spec limit. So it looks like a little bit in that tail is going to be out of spec. And we can actually see the defect rate here, which is pretty low. Now, a couple more things we can do with these simulated values that I do want to show you. I'm going to say, let's simulate 100 values to a table just to make it simple. So we don't have to just visualize it here. We can simulate these results to a table. So that's what I've done here. So here you see we have a new table with 100 rows. Most of it, about 75% of the time, we used mix A. About a quarter of the time, we used mix B. We simulated our oven temperature. The baking time was fixed at 38. And we've calculated a simulated moisture loss value. So how can we use this? I'm going to show you two different things you might think about doing in your projects. So the first goes back to talking about that great add-in that I mentioned at the beginning. I'm just going to show you a JPEG of this so we don't run out of time. But for people that are interested, um, we'll, we're happy to demonstrate and, and tell you more about this in the, during the Q&A. My colleague, Scott Allen, who is a whiz at coding JSL, made this great free add-in that you can download that you can use to assess the capability of your processes. So we can see control charts, in this case, an individual and moving range chart, range chart to evaluate uh, the stability of the process, a histogram to view our spec limit and see how we're doing um, in the long term. We can uh, test for normality. And we have some capability indices down at the bottom. On the left side, we've got a lot of options depending on what you want to see. You can highlight, select. One of my favorite things is that you can export this graph and an interactive HTML. So if you want to share with colleagues that don't have Jump, they can take advantage of that interactivity. The other thing I want to show you here is my control phase. So in my control phase, I use simulated data again. And some of this you're going to recognize. So I've got process phases before and after. So before, that's those nine rows of data points from 2013 that you saw in the beginning. That's the before, before the improvement data. And then we have after data. So this is, you know, 10 more rows uh, of simulated data from the jump simulator. Because remember, we can simulate to a table. And so what I did here is I plotted this on a control chart using jumps control chart builder. So here in the before phase, we can see the average process uh, or the process mean, which is here. Um, so average was higher before, it's lower after. We've reduced the moisture content loss. We can see the average here to the right hand side. Before we had a lot more variation, right? Our control limits that are calculated from the data are pretty wide because uh, the data is varying quite a bit. And then after, we can see that we made an improvement. We reduced the variation, and we're staying under our spec limit, uh, our upper spec limit. All right? So we can visualize the improvement that we made. And of course, we'd want to continue monitoring 
uh, the cake baking process into the future to make sure uh, we're not out of spec. We can monitor that on a control chart if we like, make sure everything is stable, and maybe run another capability analysis um, if we think we have a problem. So that's what I had to share with you today. I hope that your takeaway from this is that Jump has all the tools you need to organize, execute, document, and share your Six Sigma project. 